All right, we are, we're live. Uh, sorry if y'all were a couple minutes late. Uh, my name is Melanie Dizon. I'm the Director of Education and Content at the Davis Finney Foundation. And I'm here today with Dr. Richard Marr. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Mel. Thank awesome. you. So good to have you. Um, you were just uh, stuck in traffic and uh, making your way back. How's that going? Oh, it's, you know, Anyone who has Parkinson's knows what it's like when you start rushing. Everything kind of turns up a little bit. So I was driving back and then, of course, I'm held up in traffic getting back to my computer and and then I'm behind the school bus because it's oh, four yes. o'clock. And you don't want to be behind a school bus like cursing it, right? The school bus is all good. Sure enough, a little girl gets off it and she skips her way all Aww. the way back to her house. Um, so just, it. No care in the world. <laughs> yes. So that was my lesson. I was, I parked the car and I skipped myself to the back door and nice. came in. So uh, we you. had a, we had a, um, one of our ambassadors today, Brian Reedy. Uh, yeah. Polly, always the school bus was, uh, gave us, did a little session on laughter yoga for us today. And he said that one of his strategies now is that, you know, whenever he he's in traffic and he, he lives in California and he drives and he starts to see the red lights just starts laughing. He's like, it just releases all that good stuff. And he just laughs it. I'm like, yeah, that's smart. I, I always, uh, my daughter and I will joke that, you know, somebody's going really slowly and I'm not a, I'm not a terribly slow person. And I will, I'll just be like, oh, thank you so much for going so slowly. You are just really making it safe for everybody out here. You know, like I have to go to that place <laughs> instead of getting all crazy. That's it. Okay. Um, so, uh, so how are you doing, Mel? You never get to answer that question. Right? Oh. You ask, you ask all of uh, all of us guests how we're doing. Thank you. I'm doing great. I'm doing good. I'm doing great. Uh, for for some people who may not know you and may not know um, anything about you, I'd love for you to tell us who you are. Tell us a little bit about your Parkinson's diagnosis, how that came to be, what you were doing beforehand, all that good stuff. Um. Okay. I'm a uh... Richard Maurer, I was, I'm a naturopathic doc, um, a naturopathic physician. I've been in practice in Maine um, for the past 30 years. Uh, you know, back when I went to naturopathic medical school, it was 35 years ago, and there were only two schools in Oregon and Washington. So that was my Northwest adventure. Um, it, it didn't hold me there. My family is from the East Coast. My wife's family is from the East Coast. And we felt pulled back. So uh, Maine, Maine feels a little as close to that, though, right? I mean, right. For being Portland, really as far as could be. You're absolutely right. There's a yeah. Portland to Portland effect. And yeah. you can still get that. Um, you know, it's Lush. a little bit. Yeah. And it's a little bit off the beaten path. You know, we're a terminus state. Um, uh, so I've enjoyed practice here. What's um, over the past 10 years, I've really specialized in metabolic health. You know, I. Um, half my patients were type two diabetic or pre-diabetic, you know, mostly because I wrote a book 10 years ago on the subject and, um, you know, having people use blood tests and, you know, rational diet, nutrition and medication adjustments so that they can find their optimal metabolism. So, you know, metabolic health was sort of my thing. I was lecturing at the paleo conferences and, you know, some of the, uh, hip, um, you know, locations that were integrating medical curricula with fitness and, um, you know, sort of bold, low carb nutrition. And um, I loved it. It was a good mashup. Um, you know, I, I, I'm stunned. So over the past few years, I've had a little curveball thrown at me. And, um, you know, I was diagnosed last year with Parkinson's after watching a tremor for about six months, um, very mild tremor. And the assumption was this was probably going to be my mother's tremor coming out in me. You know, I'm last year I was 55 years old. I thought simple. She has benign essential tremor has had it almost as long as I can remember. Um, you know, more of an action tremor as people know in this, in this world. So she doesn't write checks anymore. She is embarrassed when she, writes her Christmas cards. Um, and while waiting for a doctor's appointment to get that squared away and to try some things, you know, I was doing stuff like, 
you know, no alcohol for three weeks and then three days of just not hard drinking, but, you know, having three drinks at a social party and then just watching at the end of it, how good is the tremor? And uh, damn, if it wasn't really exactly the same, which Mm -hmm. is not what essential tremors should do. Um, You know, I tried uh, THC a couple times just thinking, Oh, I know that helps essential tremor and um, it really didn't touch this. Definitely doesn't help so, Parkinson's. Yes. No, sure. doesn't. Um, I haven't, I haven't had it since. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, was sort of looking back in time, I had a weird sort of set of symptoms with kind of once I hate to even talk about a, uh, an adverse reaction to a vaccine just because it triggers all the people who want to, call them poisons. Um, but, uh, it paralyzed my left arm after a vaccine. I thought that's weird. And even I was looking up online, like, should I post this symptom on the side effects list through the government? And I was searching all the side effects through my medical database and, um, there was no one else having this symptom. Mm. So it was, a, uh, it was something that was just peculiar. And I think that was the beginning about three years ago that, I was seeing something and then I was on a good mountain bike ride with a, you know, a great friend of mine and we were in Jackson hole, Wyoming, and we had just done a 10, 12 mile hike at 10,000 feet. And I had arrived the day before. And then we were on a mountain bike ride after a little snack. um, And I bonked at the last two miles, Um, fell down, cracked my helmet, lost consciousness for five minutes you know, scared the pants off the guys I was with. Um, CT scan after was all normal. And I just kept saying, said to the doctor, said to everyone with me, like, I lost consciousness before I hit. Mm. Like, there was something else that happened here. Like, this was, and it's hard to say, you know, I don't think it was a concussion when I have a cracked bike helmet and I'm bleeding from my you know, forehead, it's, <laughs> I'm not the best person to be diagnosing myself. Um, but I think in hindsight there too, it was this left side wasn't communicating normally. And I probably had a bit of a neurologic orthostatic event mm-hmm. um, uh, without proper hydration. Um, and then I thought the great thing to do would be to borrow a log splitter when everyone left the house. And I decided to split a quarter to a wood all at once. And I got my finger caught in the log splitter and lost my finger and was um, casted up. And that again, took the left side of my body and casted Mm -hmm. it up. I lost all my, you know, all my muscle mass. I was in pain and swelling and people kept seeing me walking and my arm was shaking and they're like, Oh my God, you look like you're in so much pain. And I stopped even answering them. I was trying to tell them I'm actually not in pain. I don't understand the tremor, mm. but um, that put the Parkinson's in turbo drive. Yeah. Um, having just so much trauma to that side. Um, so was diagnosed last year, you know, saw one doc who said, it's odd. Um, I thought, okay. He said, it's, it, it this could, was be, a, an essential, regular, yeah, it could be an essential. This could be an essential. Naturopathic also? Or no, just... this, this was a nature, uh, a, a, um, our movement disorder specialist at Maine Medical Center. Oh, okay. Um, so this is the uh, neurologist. I was tracking it down, and he said, uh, it could be Parkinson's. It could be a very unusual presentation of an essential tremor. And, and I finally wrote, you know, I caught him afterwards and said, um, what are you? Are you 80-20? 50-50? Like, what is it? And he goes, uh, 60-40, which to me meant I'm going to get a second opinion. Like, yeah. <laughs> 60-40 doesn't guide right. me down the path right um and uh, a month later i'm in boston at brigham seeing uh, another um neurologist movement disorder doc and he is actually ironically his name is michael fox um oh, that so was- this other mike fox uh, took a look and it was pretty immediate like this is parkinson's um, right. and uh encouraged you know to go the course tremor dominant um uh, the goal is to keep it that way and do what I could. And both neurologists basically sent me out the door with C in six months. 
Mm. Um, in, in Boston, I, I'm seeing them once every year mm -hmm. just as a sort of backup neurologist. Um, and uh, I found it interesting when I was even in Boston asking him, do you know about the Davis Finney Foundation? Because at that point, my friends, um, uh, dear friends are also um, very good old friends with uh, Connie and Davis Finney. So they put me in touch right away. And um, I'm down there in the neurology department, even checking out, asking the receptionist, do you know about the Davis Finney? Thing? Nobody had a word about it. Um, it made my head shake because it's not like they gave me an alternate source of information. Mm. You know, they, they, they left me with nothing. Um, yeah. You know, both organizations. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not somebody who's going to walk away with nothing and be happy with that. So, right. um, I, after the second, uh, after the confirmation diagnosis, I had to explain to my wife, Alexandra, and I said, I'm going to leave you, not leave you, but I'm going to psychically leave you for the next three to four months mm. because I'm going to read everything I can find on Parkinson's, um, so I just, I had two books by my bedside and I had um, every podcast. I was just taking walks to listen to webinars and podcasts and I was reading journal articles. I've got 10 files just holding different articles about, about tremor, about Parkinson's, about the diagnosis, about the genetics, about the, a lot about the nutrients because I'm a naturopath. So, you know, just what is it about this and that? And then I kept my database i'm one of those people who also doesn't go private with something mm. so i immediately wrote a not immediately but within weeks i wrote a letter to all of our friends and acquaintances you know close our close circle mm -hmm. um and explained what it was what was going on what the tremor was about um you know to be there for not so much me because i've got my job description already written for me. It's more for Alexandra. And, mm -hmm. um, and then I wrote that again. Uh, I wrote a different letter to all of my patients, you know, 5,000 people, you know, in my active logs um, and colleagues writing saying, heads up, this is what's going on. There's some changes in the way I'm going to be practicing. Um, uh, just putting it out there. A lot of medical people get this. So the responses I'm getting back are, Oh, you've got to try. <laughs> and, you know, I thought we could make this a fun right. you know, dissertation, nothing, most of which you have heard of, like, you know, you've, you've got to try methylene blue. I've mm -hmm. got a good source, um, medical grade. It's hard to find. It can be pretty expensive, but I can help you out with this. And um, that was one physician. And another one's like, I've got this guy who's He's called the medical medium. I don't even want to say his name on the internet because right. just add to his his stars. Right. On Google searches. Um, but I, you know, I'm someone who I'm going to go and I'm going to read all the articles about methylene blue and mm -hmm. you know, the theory that there may be a virus that is harboring some activity in the brain or biofilms or um, and whether the um, whether this medical medium comes up and says it's all mercury toxicity, like all Parkinson's, all neurodegenerative disease is mercury toxicity. And there's not, it's not fluky. You know, there were, there were four cadavers in the study that he bases apparently everything on, um, you know, two cadavers of Parkinson's people and two cadavers that aren't. And Parkinson's people had more mercury in the substantia nigra, um, uh, in the area of the dopamine, dopaminergic neurons, which sounds pretty associative and compelling. Um, not quite enough to say this is the cause of all <laughs> neurological conditions, but it was enough for me to run my mercury level in my blood and, you know, just dot I's and cross T's and, um, you know, some things I did pursue and take certain things for and most things I didn't. Yeah. Um, but it was quite a list of, and I can't imagine, you know, that so many of uh, your listeners here have had similar responses, you know. Yeah, Heather says, and, uh, essential oils, stem cell patches, psychic healers, uh, <laughs> so much snake oil to spend money we no longer have. 
us. So, right. Yeah. Right. And so funny, you know, that, yes, we actually yes. funded, Polly said we funded a study with Dr. Michael, Mike Fox. Um, we did. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he goes by Mike D. Fox. He Mike uses his Fox. middle initial. So he's he, got to, right? I mean, he's got to. Yeah, <laughs> he can't say Michael, so I I, yeah. I call him Mike Fox, even yeah. though. And I want to jump in real quick. Yeah. Renee um, says, "How is a movement disorder specialist different from the services a PT or neurologist offer?" So a PT, you're usually talking to a physical therapist. They're not a medical doctor. They're dealing with the phys you know, physiology, movement, all of those kinds of things. A neurologist is general, a general neurologist is dealing with, um, you know, brain issues. A movement disorder specialist is very much specialized on Parkinson's, um, ALS, um, MS, those kinds of things. So they've gone through an extra fellowship. They have done specific training in these areas. And a lot of times people do get confused and think, how does my neurologist not have experience with Parkinson's. And the reality is many of them don't, you know, they don't have a lot of experience with Parkinson's. That's going to come from being a general neurologist often in an area where there is not a movement disorder specialist. And they just like a primary care physician might see somebody with Parkinson's because there's nobody else in the area. But if there's just the neurologist, they might see some people with Parkinson's, they might not. And so they don't have that extra training. And so Definitely always recommend people to get to see a movement disorder specialist if it's possible uh, for so many reasons. Unfortunately, there's not a ton of them. There's certainly not enough to treat everybody with Parkinson's. So that's uh, that's a problem that we face um, for sure. Uh, as she says, a naturopath identified Parkinson's a year prior to my diagnosis. Interesting. Heather, I'd never known that before. Um, and then Richard, can you, you admit, uh, originally talked about a lot of the things that sort of the progress, the, the first I felt it here and then the left side and all of those things. And, and Heather says, um, how did you handle so much loss at once? Um, how, huh. what was happening? I guess I don't see it as, I said, I never really felt it as a loss. I mean, the 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 challenge happened. I, I think I felt a a sorrow for sorrowful drag on my on my soul for a, a few minutes. I and then I just okay, what's next? You know, where do I go with this? Um, you know, I had certain challenges. There's those those weird things you you talk to. You know, I'm talking to my wife when I finally decided to take my finger. The worst thing was I, they didn't take my finger off right away. They tried to put it back on. So for two months, my body was rejecting this foreign alien that was mm. stuck back on. So that, that pain distracted me from loss, you know, fine. And then therefore finally getting that finger off, I'm like, great, great. I called my salsa partner and said, will you still, <laughs> Please still dance with me and uh you know she was cool with it so i thought great i guess i don't need that finger i'm i'm old enough um i i think like a lot of people it's the message i just i get over and over is that um you know gratitude plays my you know plays my first hour of the day and it plays my last hour of the day and I work to address it and recognize it throughout the day. Mm. Um, so it's, a. Uh, I never feel loss from this, which mm. seems strange just because it's, it's a severe pain in the ass, pain in the ass, you know, the <laughs> tremor dominance is, you know, as, as the neurologist will say, Oh, good. It's tremor dominant. Um, you know, from right. a prognostic standpoint, you right. know, it's really, a, you know, I've, and I've used the word good and inspired and, um, you know, enough with my Parkinson's diagnosis that obviously there's something I'm getting from it. Mm -hmm. um, and it has slowed me down, which isn't necessarily a bad thing for me. So mm -hmm. says my brother. Right. You know what I find is so interesting was that uh, when you were talking about your experience, there are, there's, you know, the people who 
were sort of active in their life, that were very already attuned to their body, really notice things right away. I mean, they're just like, whoa, something is not quite right, you know, because you're just, you're in your body. You're more in your body than a lot of people. And I think that there are just a lot, a lot of people that live with symptoms for a really long time because they're just either they're getting older and they think, well, this is just getting older. Um, but you were really attuned each, each time something else happened. Uh, the other thing that was really interesting to me was that you, you, you had a way of, you know, going into it and saying, okay, I'm going to try the alcohol thing, which most people don't, you had enough information about, you know, cause your mom had a uh, essential tremor right. and you had some of that information that you did some of those tests. Most people would never know to do that. Right. Um, so it, it's, I don't know. I just find it fascinating how people finally arrive at, at uh, right, right. where they are. So. And I did try propranolol too. I mean, mm. uh, those people who do have essential tremor, um, you know, I did add that in. I think I was at, I tried 20 milligrams and, you know, I'm calling the doc up and saying, you know, I'm not noticing a thing. This isn't working. And he goes, well, you could try 40 milligrams. And I think that was last August or September. And it was pretty hot then. And at that point, the propranolol was adding to my Parkinson's state. And I was just, uh, the dehydration was causing so much orthostatic. Oh, yeah. I was, every time I stood up, I had to hold on to something. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you put me at 40 milligrams propranolol. I am just going to collapse. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think I did it for one day. I went to 30 milligrams just to see, like, is it going to? Obviously, I was hopeful, right? Sure, I, I, sure. Know, I wanted it to be responsive, yeah. Yeah. knowing full well that this this was not yeah. the essential tremor game or familial tremor. Yeah. Even though, and then, of course, digging back again, part of my, you know, four month. I won't call it a master's degree because that would be insulting for people that have really done, you know, the master's programs. But to me, it was that little uh, crash course. Um, having a family member with a central tremor leaves me two times more likely to developing Parkinson's. Um, but if I develop Parkinson's, I'm three times more likely for it to be tremor, yeah. tremor dominant. Yeah. Um, I've been, I've been waiting. I have a file on that and, we're waiting for if there's so much of a link, where's the gene? Like, right. where's the marker? And we have yet to see an identified gene for even benign essential tremor. Yeah. Um, no less the convergence of Parkinson's. And here again, this will have to be when the phenotypes are all laid out as different variants of Parkinson's. Right. You know, in the future of the diagnostic change that needs to happen. Yeah. Um, this will be one of those. Uh, right. side shoots. Chris says, are you still focused on reading everything you can about Parkinson's or have you adjusted and rebalanced your focus as more time has passed? Yeah. Oh, thank you, Chris. Um, the three to four months that I was deep diving was kind of, un I knew I said it was going to be three to four months because I knew it was going to be unhealthy, mm. you know, uh, in a way that, you know, I no longer even um, you know, fortunately, they weren't releasing Ted Lasso's at the time, right? So, <laughs> I, so I, I wasn't missing much. Um, you know, I just, I gave up every other entertainment. I didn't read fiction. I wasn't reading characters. I stopped reading the paper. Um, I was just reading that one thing. So uh, I did for? stop that, but, I, but I still for? dive into everything I can. What were you reading for? Oh, we're going to get existential, aren't we? I mean, come on. <laughs> what are you reading for? Um, I think it just, it stuns me how little is known about this condition, um, about my condition. Uh, when I say, again, we can't, I can't really use that, this condition, because it's as though there's, there's an entity there. Um, but about my condition, you know, that the neurologists couldn't explain it to me. Um, and not just because they didn't have time, but they don't they don't have time to read these amount of this, these articles. So many of the journals that I was tracking down, interestingly, so many of them are open source. So I'm not having to use my, you know, Lonesome Doc or my WebMD access and pay forty dollars to get the article. Mm -hmm. So many of them are open 
PDFs. Um, many of them are international. Many of them are NIH. Um, some are coming from universities. You know, Stanford usually releases everything and open sources it when they do it. Um, just really great access. Um, and there's no way the neurologists are reading these things. And most of them are from the past five years, except for some of the things like, you know, thiamine, you know, the vitamin B1 craze. And it's, mm -hmm. it, you know, every study goes back 25 years and it all has Antonio Constantini, you know, the, the one guy who was using injectable B1 on just about everything he could, as far as I could see, everything he saw. Right. <laughs> Anxiety, ADHD, but, you know, obviously they, he pioneered it as Parkinson's for a while. And I know they were trying to get a study through the Michael J. Fox PPM uh, program and they didn't get funding for that. And, um, you know, it didn't stop me from using a couple grams of B1 for a month just to see. Mm -hmm. You know, why, knowing that that's harmless um, and, you know, the cost is pretty contained. And if I don't right. see changes in a month, uh, great. For which I didn't see changes in a month. If anyone listening is right. hanging oh, on listening. the edge of their seat. Okay. They're all, they're all listening um, saying, wait a minute, am I going to do that now? Right. Exactly. I have to, but I, you know, and I, since I brought up B1, I just, you know, that's one of those that comes in. I was also on high doses of B12 and, you know, I've measured my homocysteine and, you know, and I think this is why a lot of the, um, you know, very informative interviews on the DPF website, there's a lot of agreement in taking a B complex, mm -hmm. you know, a good quality, high enough potency B complex, just to cover those bases. There's, you know, there's obviously three ways we can supplement. One is supplement just the physiological needs which for B vitamins is like one, two, three milligrams for many of the, you know, B1, B2. Um, and then there's, you know, super physiologic where we're taking B50, you know, or B100s and we're getting 50 to 100 times that little physiologic dose. Um, and then there's pharmacologic where you're injecting a gram of B1 in somebody, um, you know, and, I think so much of so much of the benefit happens in that physiologic to super physiologic level. Mm. We don't need the super doses that are often used for one thing or another, whether it's mega dosing vitamin D or whether it's, you know, using excessive doses of B1 as an individual nutrient. I think, you know, that that prudent circle around the nutrients, um, you know, getting more than the average bear, but not overdoing it it's that you know i think mark twain has a quote about that and with whiskey <laughs> <laughs> yes. too much is too much but you know yeah um lauren says what do you think of the recent study from the university of helsinki that parkinson's can be caused by a bacteria from the gut there is um right there's association with dysbiosis i had another colleague who gave me the name of a company saying i need to do um a fecal transplant postbiotic supplement um you know for somebody that said you know spending a lot of money that we don't necessarily have you know one bottle of this stuff is a lot of money and you know even if i could access it wholesale it was still a lot of money um and there's actually not a lot of agreement that adding probiotics is very a very good idea. Um, there's some adverse responses to probiotic additions. And, and then there's also the problem that the labels of what is said on probiotics, for the most part, don't match unless right. you're on unless you're using probiotics that have three or less strains. But once you start mixing complex strains, we're all shrugging our shoulders. Like, yeah, it says PB16, but we don't know which 16. Mm. Um, maybe one of them is in there, but it's a, it's a little hit or miss. Um, and I think there is a, so there is a relationship to the gut cause Parkinson's. Uh, no, there is certainly an association going on. And, you know, again, I can, we're not going to talk poop here, maybe, but, um, you know, everyone in, who has Parkinson's notices a change in their gut and bowel. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, once I've 
I've dialed in my my zinc and magnesium and what what works for me for the little caffeine intake and you know my diet you know if anything my gut's better than it's ever been mm, interesting um, so uh it's, Somebody it's says, dramatically different yeah but I don't, so i don't know i know the helsinki research i think it's just very preliminary yeah and i don't think we have any insight yet i think there is a ton of research going on about you know, epigenetic switches and gut bacteria and our bodies. And we are 10 years off before we can come up with causation um, or therapeutics yeah. related to those studies. Oh, Rory says, thanks for this. My channel's about the microbiome. I'm a pharmacist. Walking seems to help my symptoms. Latest theory is Roundup kills good bacteria in the microbiome. Probiotics do not help. They're missing your plasmids and the gut makes neurotransmitters. That's Rory's story. There's, yes. And what he's touched on is, you know, he mentions three or four almost disparate things that the gut is doing, you know, that, that are all combining and coalescing to mm. our neurological health. Yeah. Um, so when we try to reduce it down to there's this bacteria and it's causing Parkinson's. Yeah. That's a sensational headline. Right. There's, that is there's, a, there's ooh, just too much going on. Be that lovely and easy. Wouldn't it, right? be? Wouldn't it be that? Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit. So obviously tremor dominant. Um, and when you went to your doc, did you go, um, did you start, dr uh, Parkinson's meds right away? And did you experience, you know, symptom relief? How, how did that whole, how has that process worked? So I did not, I, I, I hung in there for about six months without using any medications. Um, I started taking medications only about, oh, let's say two months ago. Okay. And, and what made you, I was, made you do it? I was going to be traveling, mm. um, you know, going to uh, Paris and then the South of France and then on a one week bike tour through Portugal, you know, a nice, lovely trip, lots of activity, um, you know, overnight flights, sleeping on a, basically a park bench in the Lisbon airport. Um, and I was expecting because of the stiffness that was going on in my arm and wrist that I was actually going to hold myself back from being able to do what I want to do. Um, that I wouldn't be as stable as I wanted to be in my strength, uh, for cycling. Um, so I started Levo, I started the cinema. Mm -hmm. Um, I was told that, and because the movement disorder doc I'm using in Portland, Maine, um, he was pretty clear, like the, the tremor dominance is not going to respond to some of the medications that might be started earlier, mm -hmm. you know, the MAOB right. inhibitors. Um, generally, the tremor doesn't respond very well. Um, and the fact is, the tremor hasn't res doesn't respond that well to even levodopa. Oh, really? Um, all that much. So I, I probably haven't given it high enough dose. You know, I was started at half a pill three times a day and he wanted me to go up to a pill three times a day, but the stiffness went away so quickly mm. with the levodopa that I thought, well, maybe that's good enough. Mm -hmm. I'll tolerate the tremor. And as you're seeing me do here, every now and then I lean over and just sit on my hand so that I can plant it. Um, you know, the, the stiffness being gone, my strength being good. I, I have my full activity list going. Um, I'm now at half a pill twice a day mm. and trying to keep it on the simple side. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, I mean, you have a wealth of information in your head from your patients, from the, all the years of working with everybody. What are you doing? What, what's complementing um, this, your medication? I almost have to go with what's not. Um, <laughs> You know, like a lot of people, I'm especially in the first year of diagnosis, like I'm, I'm doing the rock steady boxing. I'm keeping up with my um, keeping up with my uh, salsa classes. I work out in a doing a gym circuit three, four days a week um, when the weather wasn't so good here up until a few weeks ago when I left. I was doing a pedaling for Parkinson's at least twice a week. One with Tom, one with John, mm -hmm. um, you know, who I now consider friends, you know, just 
you know, the connection on Zoom really does work. Yeah. Um, and you're going to get to, you're coming you next week. I'm coming. You're going to see me uh, next week on yeah. Thursday. I was, I was just on the call with Tom and we were just talking about the event and now you're coming. Yeah, I have got to reach out and set up some uh, coffee talk uh, yeah. visits <laughs> and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Um, you know, I couldn't miss the opportunity. But um, so I'm, I'm complimenting with all the physical activity things, you know, uh, where I was just this afternoon after clients, I went in and I had not one ther physical therapist, but two of them working on me at the same time. Mm. They're, they're both trying to do, they're both trying to like learn about Parkinson's. So I'm their subject. And when you say they were working on dialogue, you, what were they doing? It's, they're not actually doing it. It's more uh, postural restoration. So mm -hmm. it's a lot of, um you know, subtle postural exercises to re-coordinate my collapse, you know, to, mm -hmm. you know, you know, we walk into Parkinson's not as perfect, balanced, symmetrical humans. And the, you know, the left-sidedness makes this all even worse for me. So mm -hmm. just getting that postural restoration has been great. And then supplementation, I almost don't want to, I don't want to go into it because it's complete. It's what's working for me. You know, I don't want it to be a, a marker for other people, you know, things like, you know, I have a family history of glaucoma cataract. So I use a pretty high dose of zinc. Mm. Um, I do have some of the, you know, 23 and me, you can dig through and I have some of the genes associated with increased risk of glaucoma. So I'm at 50 to 60 milligrams of zinc every day. And I'm taking I still pop an extra B1 occasionally. I take high dose of tyrosine. Um, I use creatine every day. Um, I, I really, I'm, I'm really struck by the research about uh, how weight loss uh, in the first one to two years of diagnosis is associated with substantially worse prognostic mm -hmm. endpoints. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the same with, you know, men over the age of 72 who lose weight they're on fast track to dementia. Yeah. Separate of Parkinson's entirely. So, you know, really for me, maintaining strength and muscle mass in my later fifties is challenging. So I take a card from some bodybuilders playbooks and I'm using proteins. Uh, yeah. Well, so Lauren says, um, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure if you know this person because she said, have you finalized a blood panel for Parkinson's? I'm not sure. Oh, isn't that lovely? Yes. I haven't, I have not finalized it. I've submitted it. I'm trying to get one of the direct lab companies to put together the panel at the best price. You know, it's nothing I do personally. This is just, Got I'm it. trying to help them do it. So it's, uh -huh. it's through a, through a direct lab. So Ulta lab tests is, okay. should have something available. Um, yeah, when I'm you like when you after you kind of got your diagnosis, did you go through your whole do a whole nother blood panel and say like, oh, where where are some here are some interesting notes of uh, inflammation or anything like anything yes. like that? When I did mine, yes, is that, yes, good. Um, so I did notice my my mercury was high. I generally like to see it below five on a on a random sample of a, a blood mercury. So I'm not doing any challenge. It's just a sing single sample blood mercury. I'm pretty careful about what I'm eating. So I'm not eating high mercury foods. It wouldn't be from a recent exposure. And my number came back at 10. Enough where I was attentive. Um, and I did, a, I did a program of some supplements and extra greens and a bunch of citrus pectin and um, a lot more sweating and, you know, finally just dialed back on those pokey bowls of tuna that I yeah. would sometimes dive into. And, uh, you know, I did retest that afterwards and it came back at three. Uh -huh. So uh, did it change any of my symptoms? No, no, not at all. But, uh, but it but also was one is thing. an indicator. Like you, you could man, like you were managing that you, you, you had the ability to yeah. change some things to bring it down. Right. So I've seen that uh, effective enough. I, I have run, um, I ran complete metabolic panels. The fact that in a, uh, I've been in remarkably good metabolic health, having been pre-diabetic in the past, um, that's certainly not my problem. You know, that's uh, so inflammation markers, CRPs, sed rates, fibrinogen levels, 
um, even white blood cell count, those all looked great for me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there's not an inflammation. Does that stop me from taking things like curcumin? Eh, I still yeah. pop one of those a day uh -huh. and I probably don't need to. I ran an omega-3 panel. I don't, you know, I eat enough fish that my own, and um, when I do eat meats, it's a lot of wild game. You know, I, I do hunt, mm -hmm. you know, so I get quality omega-3 rich yeah. foods frequently enough. So those numbers all look good. Um, uric acid was very low. Um, I, I just didn't have anything that drew my attention. My vitamin B12 was on the low side of normal. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised because I had been taking a high B12 multi and a B12 pill. Mm. So uh, I started driving some higher B12 for me. Uh -huh. I've Do you do injections or do you just still do pills? I don't. Um, I used to do injections in my office for people all the time. Mm -hmm. But now that we have that, the activated methylcobalamin form, relatively affordable mm -hmm. at 5,000 micrograms in a pill, I can get everybody to where they would be with injections weekly, mm -hmm. I can get everyone there within three, four weeks of taking a pill. Mm -hmm. So the oral doses have made it so that, you know, it used to be 30 years ago, there wasn't methylcobalamin and I could then 25, I could get it through one compounding pharmacy that gave you like 30 pills for $75. And yeah. so most people, I just say, come into the office. I'll give you a shot every couple of weeks. Right. Um, well, that's good. But, but now we have it. We have enough pills out there with that methylcobalamin form and uh -huh. high enough dose. Um, I gotta bring this up. Mike says I was just diagnosed. He says two hours ago. Is that two hours ago, Mike? Uh, he says I knew it was coming. The resources here at Davis Finney Foundation are a great find. I'm a competitive rower, and this helps explain a lot about my loss of performance. Oh, that's interesting, I, yeah. Mike. Uh, I actually did a an interview with um, a competitive rower. And uh, you could just definitely check that one out because um, he talks all about his, uh, his rowing. Wow. Two hours. Uh, that what's two hours ago doesn't surprise me as much. What I'm inspired by is someone within two hours of diagnosis is on the Davis Finney website. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm thinking maybe he found this when he was looking and saying, what's wrong with me? And yeah. either way, I'm thrilled and glad that That's you're good. here, Mike. And um, yeah, well, if you have questions, he, this is a great person to ask. So uh, let us, let us know, or if you have any concerns or anything that you would love someone to speak to. Um, so Another really fascinating thing about what your experience has been is you have all of these, these clients. Wait, same here. Right. Diagnosis confirmed today. Is this like ser are you serious? This is crazy. And they say there are only this many people with Parkinson's. I don't quite believe that. Um, right, right. We all saw the study recently, which is everything yeah. I've been reading for the past 10 years has said about 30, 35,000 new cases a year. And right. um, then it went to 40 to 45,000 about last year. And then four weeks ago, it's it came out saying, 90. it's 90s. Yeah. Um, and we all know that that's, that's not maybe half. Right. Of maybe what's truly out there. Yeah. Um, is you started, you know, talking to your patients about yeah. your experience can you tell me a little bit about that? Obviously, we talked about the doctor side and the medical professionals yeah. that were on that. But what about the people that you work with? You, um, know, you know, I think I've I practice a pretty personal style of medicine. So a lot of people know me quite well. So I had emails and cards and calls. And, you know, some people are saying, oh, I can't believe it. You know, sort of I'm so sorry. Um, uh Others are sort of listening in a little more saying, okay, I want to hear what you have to work, what you get out of this, mm. um, you know, knowing what I've done for, you know, for myself and for others in the past. Yeah. Um, the, uh, it's just been a lot of, you know, everybody knows somebody with Parkinson's. So, you know, the, the response, the, the dominant response has been, oh, maybe you can help with this. Like I know so-and-so and, you know, it was just a lot of connection points and a lot of understanding. I moved my practice to remote only. I got rid of my office. My office really required me to, you know, to make it worthwhile. I had to go in and I would be in the office for 
say eight hours. And uh, I can't do that anymore. You know, I just can't sit at a computer for that amount of time. My body cramps up and it doesn't, it doesn't work well. Um, you know, and as, as it is typing, you know, I, I don't have the D when you're typing. So I have to keep signing my name, Richard. <laughs> you know, um, so, you know, moving, moving it to a home office and doing it through Zoom, everyone was just incredibly understanding. Um, you know, unfortunately, we've been through COVID, so everyone is familiar with it as well. Yeah. So what is on the horizon for you? Apart from coming out and biking with uh, uh, my friends in Boulder. Um, and there again, my surprise was, I think I put it on my, my business Facebook page. I put a little link to the Davis Finney ride and the number of patients that came and dropped, you know, oh. $25 and a hundred dollars. And, wow. um, you know, there's a whole lot of donation money that came in through my, through my patient base, which I was wildly surprised about, like That's who lovely. gives to their doctor? Come on. <laughs> I well, was touched. That I was is a really touched that you're a, a, a really good doctor to have. So uh, it's really fun. Um, you know, I don't on the horizon. I think it's uh, this year. My goal is just to do as many of the things I love to do and see how well I can do them. You know, uh, next month I'm I'm going on a fishing trip where we're camping out, sleeping in tents on the side of the river while floating down the, the Green River in Utah. Mm. Um, uh, you know, how well will that work with my body, you know, camping out and fishing and being in a boat for chunks of time? Um, I'll see, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, where that, where the medication adjustments may need to happen so that I can do what I love to do. You know, I'm a big, you know, min minimum effective dose. So I'm trying to do the least I can to be as good as I have to be, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, I'm not shooting for, Oh my God, I'm awesome. Like I feel great. Uh, I'm shooting for good enough. And while that sounds like a cop out, um, I think I have a pretty high bar for good enough. So yeah. it, it works for me to look at it that way. Um, uh, not fall short, but you know, make sure I'm still, I'm still able to do everything. Right. Um, and I, I would expect that, you know, I'm not, it's not like I'm stopping that Parkinson's research or reading. Um, you know, I'm, I, I can't really find another book that I need to read, you know, <laughs> and, and I'm, I have to say, I'm kind of done with the books written by people that say they had Parkinson's for six months and then they're suddenly experts on, telling people what to do to cure it. Um, I, you know, not that I'm just a, you know, I'm an incredibly optimistic person, but I don't expect this thing to go away. Right. You know, not, not the persistent persistence of it. Right. Um, the, um, you know, but I, I would expect there's, I think it's just such an exciting time to, well, no, I won't say that out loud. That's the doctor um, in you. Yeah, the yeah. Science, the scientist in it's, you. I was going to say it's an exciting time to have Parkinson's. Yeah. Um, well, it's probably the best, better time than any other time to have it. I. That's it. And I don't want to, you know, I'm, I, I had to stop just feeling for, you know, knowing where some people are, um, mm -hmm. you know, that I, I don't know where they are and I can imagine the challenges. There's, there's no good time, but, um, you know, the, the fire hose of insights and research that are coming at me is, is really enticing. Um, and they're all so many different directions. You know, there is the, you know, I don't think it's going to be antiviral drugs, you know, whether it's some blue industrial dye or whether it's something made by Roche. Um, uh, I think it's, it's really going to be some of those, you know, whether it's the vibrotactile coordinated reset or whether it's, um, uh, activities like we're seeing through exercise and, you know, the, the pieces of the puzzle that are, um, it's not just normal exercise as, 
you know, Dr. Mm -hmm. J says, you know, the, it's the cadence of 80 to 90 on the bike. It's not just being on the bike. Um, and we may, you know, it's gotten me back to when I go running, I'm doing the, you know, I studied Danny Dreyer's stuff years ago when I was in triathlon days with, um, and it, it's that chi running, you know, bringing a, a shorter cadence and uh, quicker steps, which is exactly where we're talking with the cycling for Parkinson's, you know, just intentionally planting your feet below you a little more right. rapidly. Um, Turnover. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I've, I've integrated that into my walks, into my runs, into my cycling um, and just changing how I do things is kind of the way to, the way to go. Next thing I'll do is I'll get a, a coach who speaks nothing but Spanish or something. So just have it come at me in as many ways as right? possible. Right. Just challenge it in every way. That's it. Well, uh, it was really great to talk to you. And I hope that uh, we stay in touch and you, you know, I know you're, you're on the, on the edge. So you're, you're looking at different things. You're trying different things. I'd love to hear about it. I know our community would love to hear about it. And uh, you just have a, a great, like Mike said, you have, I love your attitude. Thank you for the positive outlook. Um, I think that Mike and MK uh, could both use some of that today. So really appreciate that. Yeah. And, uh, um, and I'm yeah. sorry for the, those, the people who are just talking about today. I, you know, we all remember that day when we really came home to it. And, you know, I sat my adult children down pretty quickly and had those phone calls and just said, some things are going to change. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know what I was trying to impose on them, but it was something like, you know, I'm not the, I'm not the dad you thought I was, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, you know, capable, active man. And there may be some things that are different. And I'm going to look to you guys for assistance on certain things. And it may just be a silly little thing. Like, you know, and at, at one point, I remember my daughter, you know, she's nearby and living in and out with us at 25 years old. And she was kind of pissed because I was running late to give her a ride and she's like come on and she starts going at me and I had to stop her and say not anymore mm. I can't do that mm -hmm. you know you in the old days you used to see me and I would be ahead of everything but no um and uh you know th those conversations were you know, we have to keep having with our families and with our loved ones and those people near to us. And, you know, I think after soon after diagnosis, I think I had that conversation a little bit more dire, probably like, you know, I've got to revisit the will. Yes. Um, forgetting how slowly. Urgent, this thing really, urgent. Yeah. Forgetting how slowly this thing really does progress for most people. Um, you know, I didn't need to go there right away. So those people who are diagnosed today, I, um, I'm glad they're at the DPF website and can learn from thousands, I think, if not, you know, of people who are in some way connected to the conversations and the dialogue. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Holly says, looking forward to welcoming you to Boulder next week. Oh, Roy nice. says, uh, Thanks, Triple Former. Thank you, Richard, for sharing with us your journey. Yes. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And uh, we will be in touch. So. Thank you, Mel. Thanks, I so. look forward to it. DPS we'll see you next weekend. Yes.